Hey guys, welcome to Ever See You with the Professor. All right, in today's video, we are going to be having an interview with Kenneth Liu, the CEO and co-founder of Amihan Entertainment. They are currently working on a project called Everseed, a tower defense crypto blockchain game. So let's get right to it. All right, everyone, welcome to Everseed. Today, I'm joined by Kenny, the CEO of Amihan Entertainment. Quick background on Kenny. Uh, he leads the team over at Mihan. They're working on their project, which is Everseed. Everseed is planned to be a tower defense game with roguelike elements, and it has, it will have a combined farming and MMO experience. Uh, Kenny has a distinguished background in different capacities, working in um, finance and also gaming. So welcome, Kenny. Thanks, Professor. It's great to be here, and uh, you know, just wanted to say thank you so much for being such a early and avid supporter for of our project since the since the beginning you know um uh you were uh i think one of the first ones to do like you know videos about kind of like uh uh our whole minting process and everything like that um and so yeah th it's it's great to be able to chat with you yeah you're welcome definitely my pleasure being part of the project um you know, I think when I found, first found out about the project and learned about the team, um, it was definitely something I felt like, wow, this is great. Um, you know, it, it was definitely, I think the, the the vibes that you guys sent out and sort of the um, the communication method really spoke to me and I knew I wanted to be part of the project and I really appreciated the initial uh, approach that you guys took in in building the community. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it was a little bit stressful. So I was like attending all your AMAs, part of it to learn from your uh, from your side, but also to kind of um, try to understand how to better my chances of getting uh, joined into the community. So that was definitely unique, and I, I liked it. You know, I'm not sure if you fully read what I wrote, but it was definitely something from the heart. So very happy to be part of it, and my pleasure to be creating content for Everseed. I think I really believe in this project and the team. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. That means a lot to us. And as crazy as it was for you, it was, it was even crazier for us trying to manage that. So uh, thank you for sticking us through that ride. Um, and maybe this is a good segue into probably, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Q&A. So. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know, so far it's, uh, it's worked well. I think the team has, uh, and the project has progressed so far. It's the, the starting step to now, I think it's been a great progression. So let me just, uh, jump into my questions here for Kenny. Uh, first one is I mentioned Kenny did have um, experience working in the, uh, gaming prior. So for those that don't know, Kenny worked at um, Riot Games. So question for Kenny is um, work with your experience at Riot Games and now Amihan, um, what has been the differences that you've experienced between in that traditional gaming company prior to now running a Web3 gaming company? And what adjustments have you have had to um, to make yeah, this is a good question. And it's one of those things where um, you don't really know until <laughs> until Web3, whether you like it or not, grabs you by the horns and is just like, now now devs do something. <laughs> um, so a little bit of backstory is, you know, we when, when we um, uh, uh, I had asked our team in, or at the beginning of this year to basically update our website, everseed.com with like, the bare minimum of of info and just like content you know we, we spent about maybe a week or two weeks actually shipping that um and uh, i was uh, i asked him to do it because i said you know i'm starting to go on these twitter spaces and involve myself in the web3 community and just like um uh you know we have to start building our our our, our community our follower account bit by bit and the, my team pushed back on on me and said you know oh we're not ready like we don't uh, have uh, a plan really figured out yet? Um, we don't. Um, uh, we don't have like you know assets ready. We didn't even start making NFTs or anything like this. And I was like, oh no, don't worry. Like we have to start like early, you know, uh, because we have to. You know, we're just gonna. It's a Twitter space is only like gonna have 50 or so followers. Like that's it. Uh, and we need to start picking up breadcrumbs here and there. I go on that Twitter space and then like within. Uh, less than a week, we just like had like twenty thousand like followers like overnight. It was like crazy. Um, so I did that was a huge learning experience for me. And since then, you know, we've been trying to keep up and hustle and kind of like keep up the momentum with uh, 
with the pace at which Web3 moves. I think that's the really the, the, the strongest learning lesson for me was uh, just really understanding that once you go public, and it could be just like um, a tweet, it could be your website, it could be whatever, uh, you're, you're basically operating like a live service, you know? Um, and what I mean by this is like, you know, generally speaking, game studios have the luxury of kind of, uh, quote unquote, sitting in the dark and iterating and noodling on their kind of design uh, and just like um, having the, uh, um, the kind of bandwidth to be able to do so in a way that isn't uh, urgently pressured. And, you know, we have we had did, done that over the course of about a year because we started building in March of 2021. And so I'm thankful that we didn't, you know, try and go public then. But I can only imagine, you know, what it would be like if, uh, you know, projects didn't really have this foresight and they were trying to rush to market, you know, too early uh, and then trying to, you know, make things up as they go <laughs> as they go along. Uh, that's that's you know, it was stressful for us after already having prepared for a year. And I can only imagine like the stress level if it's, you know, you haven't prepared at all. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the ways in which it, it's kind of like a sink or swim moment, like a do or die moment for a lot of projects is like, if can you keep up the, the pace and hyper momentum? If you can, then you'll be well positioned in the future. If you're not, then you're basically fall by the wayside and the hype dies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think our experience working on live service games for many years you know, myself at Riot um, and Sony Online Entertainment and Nexon, and then Paul uh, worked, you know, working at Riot for, for close to a decade, my co-founder. Um, we we uh, were able to basically improvise and uh, change the structure of our team to actually accommodate the kind of like very unique needs of Web3, uh, where, you know, we, uh, and I think that, um, you know, that was, uh, really kind of like uh, a great learning lesson for us building in Web3. Right on. Yeah, I think um, for those that are just learning about the community that haven't been in the community um, the whole time as as I have, um, that's definitely one of the things we did notice and you were um, very good in communicating it regarding the pivot the team had to make uh, in terms of being more frequent with their updates and you know not going sort of like a dark and then a delivery later on, but really being more active. And uh, I think a lot of community members have seen that. Um, you know, just highlighting a couple of things. We don't have to go into details, but, you know, your team delivered the favor system, which sort of is a staking reward for NFT holders. You guys did airdrops. You guys have done game demos. So I think you guys are really picking up the pace in terms of adjusting to that Web3 and really being able to to meet that um, <laughs> Web3 mentality of win, win, win. So, um, yeah. yeah, definitely uh, I've noticed that. Great. Thank you, Kenny. Um, Next question. I, I alluded earlier that you do have a experience in finance as well. Um, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about how your prior experience as a virtual economist in your previous experiences, um, how how much of that has translated over to Web3 and what you're trying to build out for Everseed? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one thing that's important to understand is that 95 or maybe even 99% of games at this point are uh, not compatible with an open market economy design. So their economies are closed. It's like, you know, like if you think about Candy Crush, it's like Candy Crush is monetizing an individual silo with you as a player and then someone else as a player and then someone else as a player. And there's really no kind of like peer-to-peer -peer trading or transactions that happen across uh, player to players. And while that is a very successful model to uh, you know, monetize in the free-to-play space, um, you know, historically, it's really different when you're operating Web3 because Web3 is all about open market economy design. Um, and that is a lot more complex, probably about one or two orders of magnitude more complex than, than the traditional model. And so, uh, you know, the interesting thing about open market economy design is that there's not really that many great examples of it, you know, succeeding super well. You know, you have... Uh, in a lot of ways, it's mostly MMOs that have uh, really kind of been able to embrace that model because of how complex their economies are um, and how complex the games are. So, um, yeah, I think that for for me personally, my uh, I kind of 
lucked into this, but you know, there, during the time in my career, I've mostly focused on uh, these more core experiences in terms of both game and economies. So a lot of the games that I worked on and kind of like have seen the data for and know how to actually make smart calls, uh, they include like, for example, Maple Story, uh, Dragon Nest, Dungeon of Fighter, some of the Asian MMOs from Nexon, EverQuest 22, H1Z1, Planetside 2, uh, the Western MMOs from Sony Online or Daybreak. So those experiences have been way more relevant and helpful in terms of building out our version of our, our vision for Everseed. Right on. Um, any specifics you think you could um, from those experiences, from those games that you mentioned, or even just from you know the complexities you mentioned um, compared to um, the Web 2 that you're planning to build out for Everseed's um, economy, or is that a little bit too advanced for now to talk about? I think you know one of the key things to realize is like when you are trying to when you're trying to build a product that lasts, you know, not just years, but ideally decades, uh, you're operating on a different time scale versus like a project that is only looking to do a quick cash grab for like a couple of months and, you know, maybe structure their economy to be very, very Ponzi-like. Like when you zoom out and your time frame basically gets to that level of, you know, decades, then you have to think about what happens when something bad goes wrong. Like what happens when there is a hack or exploit that's found. What happens when um, you know there's a misconfiguration or human error on the internal team? And what are your kind of controls uh, or like kill switches to be able to not kill switches, but just like levers that you can pull right. in order to actually mitigate that damage? Uh, you know, like even with like World of Warcraft, obviously a really great team behind that. Um, and there were like you know instances where you have like the quote unquote like uh, plague or virus that like. Uh, uh, you know, spread in World of Warcraft and yeah. like, you know, and they had to roll back the servers and, you know, kind of like uh, reset everyone. That you know, while a, that's easy to... I yeah. think that was Zul'Garub, right? Like the uh, the disease or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when you have a game economy that is completely within your control in terms of centralized database and servers, you could definitely do that, right? But if you're if part of your economy is basically an open market uh, with like that's like you know freely tradable with tokens, then you can't roll back <laughs> right. you can't roll back a blockchain. I mean I mean Solana does sometimes, but you know <laughs> but otherwise you can't, right? So uh, very sparingly, so uh, and not within your control. So all right, yeah, good answer. And I think um, segueing to the next question, you mentioned sort of um, you know the the, the the building that sort of longevity with the with the plan for the game and the game economy. Um, I know you're very active in Web3, not just with Amion and Everseed, but I know I know you you know through the Ranger chats and just talking to you, you've you've you're aware of other projects. So yeah, I'm a DJ. You can say it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was trying to <laughs> try to say it nicely. <laughs> yeah, as a fellow DJ, and then um, what what have you seen from around the other projects? You know, whether it's a success or a failure. Like, what have you learned from those and what have you trying to sort of pull into Everseed's design to, to build on that? Yeah, so um, let's talk about what other projects have done well that we could improve on and then we'll go in, to the uh, other side. So, you know, one of the big lessons for us was really understanding the importance of how... Um, uh, of how much like marketing and branding really play into um, uh, into generating the kind of like hype that's needed to uh, really take a community and lift off. And we kind of lucked into this ourselves by just having tens of thousands of followers uh, flock to us originally. And I think that that initial like beginner's luck, um, uh, you know, colored our thoughts but now that we've kind of uh learned the lessons from for example like okay bears or other big web3 brands then we're able to actually you know be more thoughtful around our publishing strategy and formulate a plan that will actually help us carry the game into open beta next year so um so i think the kind of teaser or alpha for our community is like uh we are working on a lot of really cool things on um, evolving the IP to 
its next level. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I have I can't like wipe this grin off my face because there's just like so much cool stuff that we're doing behind the scenes that um, that we're really excited about. Uh, but I don't want to sh- no spoilers because you know the whole point of hype is you know you got a surprise and delight. So yeah. Um. So that was one thing that we we're really really kind of like doubling down on. Um. Uh, for the next uh, next six months or so, and uh, the in terms of like you know what other things that projects have done that you know we want to avoid, I think it's pretty obvious. Like we want to avoid the kind of like big flash in the pan like Ponzi like designs. Uh, you know, I think while they may have worked for previous models like Axie, which inspired like Peg Axie or Krabata or like Step In or like all these other types of you know breeding like games, you know. I think that the market has shifted, you know, like fool me once, shame on uh, you, fool me twice, shame on me. Like, I don't think people are going to fall for the same traps, especially not during a deep bear market. And that's, I think, where we'll really shine, where, you know, our our gameplay will come uh, to the light first and foremost in terms of its its fun and accessibility. Um, and uh, and we can freely reward players with uh, with, you know, great rewards, too, that can be tokenized. So. Yeah, awesome. I think you really nailed it there. I think what's been missing and what the early projects have been focused on was sort of that, um, you know, kind of like you said, like the breeding and, you know, make money easily. But I think what's been missing with those games is the playability and the fun. I think um, yeah. they're forgetting, right? I mean, you, your experience with the gaming studio, um, I think people are forgetting that, you know, we're in it for the game with the, you know, with the blockchain and the NT and the crypto side sort of as a, as a cherry on top. And if it's the other way around, then people will will sort of lose that that passion for that game and then you know people will pull out and that's when the spiral happens mm-hmm. yeah for sure cool cool all right i know you mentioned um you know you had that big grin talking about uh surprising and delighting and you know you have your team has de- developed and delivered some things um so maybe you know without going to those specifics that you're not ready to share yet but what are the metrics so far that you've um you yourself and your team have measured against to during this building phase to really say, okay, you know, we're doing well or we're behind, um, you know, obviously there's delivering the game demos, et cetera, but other other metrics that you guys are measuring yourself up against? Yeah, we're, we're just, so I think what our community should understand is that right now we view ourselves in kind of like a closed alpha state where, you know, the only way to really participate in our play test is if you're a holder. And what we're really trying to do is to make sure that the feedback that we're getting on our gameplay is uh, from our players, from our community, from our holders, is actually um, helping us create a better game. And it, it is actually like, you know, uh, not just me, but um, the designers on our team and others, they're reading. I promise you, we're reading every message, every piece of feedback on uh, every time we do a play test. And even for related to our NFTs, you know, we're also reading that feedback as well. And um uh, and the idea is, you know, we want to keep a low profile and bide our time and wait in the dark because, uh, you know, I think that we want to make a really, really, really big splash uh, when their game goes live next year uh, in open beta. And and so um, the kind of metrics that we're trying to optimize for, like, uh, we're not trying to optimize to increase the number of um players or uh, sorry number of uh, users in our community mm-hmm. or number of um or like optimizing for kind of like token metrics like floor price at this stage like the thing that we're trying to optimize for uh, is engagement and retention in our core game because you know let's let's be really honest like um the way to actually generate true value that's long term for our holders in our community is if we deliver a great product, which is the game. Uh, without a good game, and if I don't care how much Gabe Layden shills like Digi Daigaku, uh, if he doesn't deliver a game, that project is going to zero, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. flat out, right? Like you, it's just JPEGs otherwise, right? And um, and so without a great game, NFTs go to zero. Uh, but with a good game, then you know NFTs will, you know, the the, the possibilities are limitless, and so. That's really kind of our prioritization right now. All right. Yeah. And I thanks thanks for sharing that little piece earlier that you, you mentioned about how you guys see yourself as being in closed alpha and and being purposely aware that you guys are are sort of, you know, air quotes, 
in stealth mode still, right? You guys are really yeah. trying to build that great product. So that way, when you're ready to make that marketing push or you know that announcement, then it's like, hey, this is what we have. And there's this community that's been with us this early on and we're ready to sort of, you know, reveal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, great, great. Um, so you may have answered this a little bit in some of the things you mentioned, but so what are near-term milestones that you guys are looking to deliver? I know you, you guys have talked about the roadmap. Um, so I guess for the people that are, you know, just listening in, what's the uh, near-term um, plans you guys have? Yeah, I would say that um, to talk about this on a more foundational level, there are several priorities for us. Number one is, um, uh, making sure that we continue with the pl open playtest to our community or holders. Uh, so you should expect to continue playtests. In each playtest, we will be uh, experimenting or trying new things, getting feedback, and evolve and adding more content as well to make it better and better. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's number one. Number two is, uh, you know, I think that we are uh, strategizing about how to actually reward our holders. Uh, you know, uh, who have been loyal to us. Like, I know that people who stake, who have kept their rangers in their wallets have been accumulating favor. We're thinking, uh, you know, both, you know, in the kind of, I, I, in the medium and long term, like how can we actually uh, reward folks for, uh, you know, giving them an outlet to spend that favor on different interesting things with our project. And so that's all I'll say for now, but um, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um... You know, as I mentioned earlier, you guys have pivoted and sort of delighted the, the community with, you know, favor airdrops and gameplay demo. So it's good to hear that you guys have more stuff planned for um, building on that and expanding it. Um, so you mentioned the open beta that you guys are are, are shooting for. Um, I think it's, you know, from uh, from what I've heard before, I think it's you're shooting for mid next year. And let me know if I'm wrong with that. But um, given that, let's say, you know, fast forward to October 2023, or even end of 2023, where, where do you see Everseed and Amihan team at, at that point? Yeah, so our one mission right now that the team is kind of like galvanizing around is to transform Everseed into being a thousand plus hour game with a supporting sustainable economy. And so that is uh, our goal for the next um you know, call it nine months or so, mm -hmm. uh, six to nine months. And we are going to move heaven and earth to try and make that reality. Uh, I don't think people understand how difficult it is to make a fun Web 2 game. It's probably the hardest thing that you could even do um, uh, as a profession. And then, like, trying to make a fun Web 3 game is actually, like, adding even more uh, <laughs> um, difficulty on top. But, you know, I think that it's important to understand that um, there's a there's a silver lining to hard things, which is the good thing about hard things is that once you have kind of like solved them, uh, it's really hard for a new entrant or competitor to basically take your market. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by this is like, look at what's happening right now in the general kind of marketplace drama with uh, these fight over optional royalties, right? Why does this problem even exist? This problem exists because previously in Web2, data for users or customers is basically held privately um, inside centralized databases. And so when you basically reach a certain level of scale, it's a lot easier for, if you were first or early, it's a lot easier to compound that advantage and basically generate network effects if you're a marketplace. Right. Um, and, but, in Web3, it's inverted where the users control their data. Like, you know, you have your own wallet and like all that wallet information in terms of transacting is publicly available on the blockchain. Like anyone can pull a SQL uh, and, and, and do a SQL pull and, and see it. And then, you know, you see like vampire attacks with like looks rare, basically airdropping tokens to like open sea whales and, you know, uh, and basically optional royalty marketplaces saying like, well, we'll just make the uh, trading trading 0%. And and now, and, and so the reason why Magic Eden basically made that huge overnight switch to being optional royalties is because they saw their market share collapse from 90% to basically 50% in Solana overnight, like in, within a week or so, right? Um, and when they turned on optional royalties back uh, as a feature, they jumped back up again to about 80%. 
And I think that if you see that, if you if you see huge swings like that, then uh, to uh, to an investor, that basically screams, "This is not a good investment, <laughs> right?" Mm-hmm. Like this, the same competitive moats or advantages that basically existed for Web two don't exist for Web three. And so, but really, do you know what actually like has super strong staying power in Web three? When people think about blue chips, it's all about content, right? Like, um, uh, like you know, Board Ape is a blue chip, uh, Azuki is a blue chip, um, you know, Doodles is a blue chip, etc. And so. These are all content plays. This is not like platform plays, and it's because you know you content is unique, and anyone who tries to copy it afterwards, they're just seen as a fraud or right. not a fraud, a, a just a, a you know kind of derivative, derivative right? Yep. So, yeah. So, um, so there's a really great article by Packy McCormick of Not Boring. This uh, is called "The Good Thing About Hard Things," and I think you know that's we're we're working on it, something that's very hard, but ideally will be very long lasting and fulfilling. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, you know, you, you've mentioned this in some of the way you've answered the questions. I think uh, I really appreciate the forward-looking um, vision that you guys have over there. Um, I think that's going to be a real testament to what you've talked about in terms of, um, you know, making building something that's fun but also that's going to last. I think that's that's going to be key for um, Everseed when when we're ready, um, you know, to for that open beta. So you mentioned that you know, there, you know, so people that don't know in terms of building a game or sort of don't have that game making game design background, you mentioned sort of the the, the complexities of it, the difficulty. So I, I myself don't have that background. So I guess for us that you know are participating in your your limited time de- limited limited time demos and gameplays that you guys shared to the team, and you mentioned the feedback, which the surveys, which you know I think that's great getting feedback from the community. But I guess what other information are you guys, maybe it's data or I don't, you know, I guess this is where it gets technical. What sort of information or data are you guys pulling from, you know, these limited time demos? Yeah, we're looking, we're looking mostly at engagement and retention metrics. So, um, you know, I think ultimately we don't really care about monetization. We don't even have monetization really in our game. Uh, We don't have it at all. And I think... You know, we're we're focused on again. How do we build an amazing game experience that attracts um, not just millions but billions of people? And um, and so seeing kind of like the percentage of people that uh, play uh, of of holders that play in kind of like July versus September, like you know what what percentage of them have retained? What percentage of um, you know new uh, new kind of like uh, holders like play? Um, seeing the kind of like uh times multiple uh, people will basically spend in terms of like repeating a run mm-hmm. or the amount of time that they spend in a run as they kind of play you know these are all things that we're analyzing e- each time and the uh so far the uh, the data is very promising in that it, it's it's uh it's very um it keeps going trick ticking up so yeah i mean i for one can share my experiences um you know always get that happy feeling when the announcement of the game plays live and and you know I, i'm not gonna lie it's it's uh it's made me stress when all of a sudden sorry gameplay is closed now and i'm like no i didn't get to do everything i wanted to do but yeah um i think that's just a testament to us you know having creating that gameplay that you're saying that's you know that's that's fun and also uh very engaging yeah i'm curious to get your thoughts professor what, what do you like about our game the most you know let's 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 turn the mic towards you you know what are the aspects <laughs> that you really like about it Sure. Um, I think, you know, I played lots of different game genres. Um, Tower defense is um, one of those things that I like to play as well. I think um, I'm not 100% like super into tower defense, but um, so I don't like, you know, have prior preferences or vast gameplay. Like I I played, you know, Plants vs. Zombies and then the one on the iPhone things like Frontier Kingdoms or something like that. But anyways, um, so my tower defense experience with, with Everseed has been sort of coming from fresh eyes because I don't have that, you know, hardcore element prior. So I, I like a lot of things I'm seeing that you guys are doing are, are fairly are familiar, but new to me. So I like how um, the gameplay and obviously um, as a gamer, I like the, the ability to, you know, to customize and level. So I like the part where you could choose the plants you want to play the infusions, but also water them and grow them to make them stronger units. I like that part of it. I like the variability of the companion and also the way paths are not set because, you know, plants versus zombies, the zombies just go in that straight line. But in, in you know, 
in Everseed, we have the ability to move the, uh, the, the the path around. So I like that challenge of it. And then lastly, you know, as a gamer, um, what drives me crazy is with the limited time demos is I'm trying to get everything on my Rangers leveled up. Um, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm very invested in, and uh, supportive of Everseed. So I have lots of Rangers. So it takes me a while to get them all leveled up. And so that's one of the things that um, drives me is, you know, trying to get all my guys leveled up or girls. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Th yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, it's all good. All good. Uh, next question. Um, you, you, In terms of, you know, whether it's Web3 or just game design or just community, what would you say has been the biggest challenge your team has encountered so far? And how did you guys, uh, you know, either adjust or react or respond to it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think... Uh, um, one of the one of the biggest challenges, uh, and I think this is a bit more macro or kind of like um, foundational, uh, but one of the biggest challenges I think of us building in Web3 that we've experienced firsthand is really the aspect that, you know, take nothing for granted. And what I mean by this is like the market conditions that, uh, you know, you started building in, they're uh, going to be very different maybe like, you know, uh, after you start building, which we've experienced firsthand. Um, not only that, but you know the uh, royalty fee structure that you took for granted uh, is no longer the case now, where people are kind of sidestepping that because it's not enforceable on kind of the L1 or protocol level. Um, the uh, <laughs> there's um, uh, and, and also like you know depending on who you you partner with in terms of third parties, like it's all very new and nascent. And so, you know, whoever you partner with today might not be there tomorrow. Like, you know, thank God we didn't have any type of like uh, funds custody that like, for example, with, with, you know, with terminal bid or anything like that. But I, there's definitely many startups that blew up because of that. Um, so I, I guess all this to say is that Web3 really, really benef uh, um, uh there's a premium to be placed on adaptability and um, also optionality in terms of being able to be nimble and be quick on your feet and kind of improvise. And so um, that's something that we've learned, uh, you know, for better or worse, the hard way. And um, uh, but I think that the fact that we've kind of gone through a cycle now, you know, I think before people told me that you don't really understand crypto as a consumer. Um, unless you've experienced a full bull and bear cycle. And I didn't really get what they meant, but now now that we're, <laughs> I'm a degen and a builder, and this is the first bear cycle I'm going through, I understand what they mean now. And and, um, and I very much agree with that. And so I think it's it's helpful to have this experience and, and kind of also emerge unscathed from it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think um, that's one thing that's, Again, you know, you being not only leading the team, but also being immersed in, you know, call it, you know, the culture and the uh, the environment. I think it, you're able to sort of um, be be quick on your feet because you're you're seeing the trends and getting that experience. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you know the goals of of onboarding millions and even billions of of, of people. Um, as we know, you know, crypto is is exciting and new but it's also not the safest space it's 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 you know it's it can be a little bit complex there's a learning curve when somebody's just jumping in um so i i know that you've talked about before how you know the the, phone, the game is uh, has a long-term plan of being in a mobile um and that you know there's sort of um avoidance of mentioning nfts and cryptos because it's just prohibited but you're sort of taking that strategy of you know players play and then later on they'll get a ping about you know that one of the things that they've earned or owned is an NFT. Um, how about beyond that? Like, what's the plan with solving that friction and the, you know, that difficulty that um, new users need to onboard to Web3 in terms of, you know, then how do they download a wallet? How do they uh, you know, learn about connecting to signs, signing transactions, making sure that they don't get fished or hacked? Like, I know you're a thoughtful guy and you really care about the community. So what's your sort of, um, you know, initial plans or, or thoughts about that? Um, this might, uh, yeah, I think that this is actually something that's very core to our long-term strategy. So I'm not sure about, uh, the comfort okay. level of me being able to share this, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, I'll say though, is, um, there's tremendous opportunity in web three, um, tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And I look back to kind of 
the behemoths, the titans of Web2 today. And um, think about how they're able to dominate in their space. So, uh, you know, a lot of people would immediately think about like Fang, like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But actually, if you think about on an international scale, uh, there are certain companies that are basically the sum of all the above. And for example, Tencent in China, you know? And if you think about like how Tencent started, it started with like QQ, which is like a very simple messenger app. Uh, And then it grew with, you know, games. And then once uh, beyond games, they basically built up payments and they built up, um, uh, uh, you know, social media with WeChat and they built an entire kind of empire uh, or, or, you know, conglomerate, like, you know, on top of that, on top of those really humble and early beginnings. And um, ultimately, you know, we're still so early in Web3, where the best killer app that we've had to date so far has been like Axie and, and Stepin, one can argue too, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and <laughs> I don't think either of these are like shiny examples of like, you know, what a sustainable right. business model would, should, should or would look like, right? Agreed. Um, and, yet, and yet the on-chain users for Axie in July of this year after the crash still uh, superseded OpenSea or Market, Magic Eden daily, transaction, daily transactions, sorry, daily uh, on-chain users. And so that's a great, really powerful statistic, right? Um, and uh, and so the key though is basically focus and prioritization. Like, if we build a wallet, a marketplace, a whole bunch of platforms or tools, um, but don't have a good game, then our company is going to zero. Because why would anybody want to use yeah. our marketplace, our wallet, or whatever solution? Uh, over, you know, obviously the existing incumbents, right? But if we build a great game first and foremost, and even if we build the other stuff later, then it could, then we're still basically well advantaged because ultimately people are still going to come back to the game, right? And that replayability, that retention is strong. So, uh, yeah, so, so like I said, like, you know, games are hard to make. Not every team can pull it off well, but, you know, um, but I think that... We've shown, we've put our money where our mouth is and we've shipped demos to our community and our community has spoken with their, um, with both quantitative and qualitative feedback. And, you know, we're, we're uh, um, happy to continue building for, building out this great product for you all. Yeah, agreed there. Um, and sir, uh, let's talk about Secret Sauce. Um, what do you think will set Everseed apart from the other games and projects out there? I mean, you've given so many great responses and examples. Um, what would be the one thing you'd say? Uh, uh, um, man, I, why, why are you trying to give out all the alpha? Well, that's, can, that's the thing. You well, know? I'll take I'll take a no comment. That's fine too. I mean, you know, um, I would say accessibility. Okay. Accessibility is our secret sauce. Um, and yeah, accessibility is our secret sauce in the sense that, um. Look, when we built, so here's what I'll say. Okay, game, games take a long time to make, period. And so any game that comes onto the market very quickly in a new paradigm of an industry, like think about the kind of games that have uh, been shipped to date. They, the reason why they came to market quickly was because they were already in development before they pivoted to Web3. Mm-hmm. And like I just mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, 95 to 99% of games in Web2, they're not, they're not synergistic with the business model of, of Web3, of open market economies, right? right. And uh, to just like take a kind of existing game in, that was built for Web2 with a Web2 business model, but didn't do well, and just trying to uh, pivot to Web3, shoehorn it to Web3, and slap tokens on top, it's not really going to work. Uh, you know, it might give you a little bit of cash, but it's not going to be a long-term business. We basically built Everseed from the ground up, starting with our introduction to Web3, which was before Axie's hot summer. So everything that we've done was basically with in mind of, like, how do we onboard 
the masses to Web3? How do we onboard continents, not countries? Mm -hmm. And that is about lowering the accessibility bar uh, where, you know, um, as many people as possible can access the game and uh, for, for free and play and earn. And so that's really our secret sauce there. Great. Thank you. I mean, really appreciate that. Again, you know, very thoughtful. Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, listening closely and that know you understand sort of, you know, the, the deep thought that you have. And I mean, I just, you answering the other questions, I think I really, really impressed when you pull, you know, just experiences outside of crypto and just sort of building that in. It just shows how aware you are and, you know, how, how much, you know, how, how, how much vision there is in terms of seeing not just the, the project goal, but also what's out there and sort of keeping that up. So again, I think these are the things that I saw with you and the team early on, which is what got me really, really hooked into the to the project and really supportive of it. Um, so as as a fellow Web3 degen, you know, um, I found out about Everseed through, you know, just ran through another project. Uh, you mentioned Step In. I actually, I, I was listening to a lot of their MMAs early on and um, you probably know this guy. I think his name is Jason from Maple Leaf. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he jumped on an AMA with Stefan, and then they they interviewed him. And then at you know one of the last questions they asked him was you know you're invested in Stefan, but what else is out there? And he dropped Everseed, and then he didn't he didn't he just named Everseed and that was it. He didn't say anything else. And so that got me you know like okay this guy <laughs> seems like he's in the industry. He knows what he's doing. I'd never heard of him before, but I started researching, and that's how I found you guys. So I I don't think I've told that to anyone, but that's how I found this you know sort of that from a DGen. So now as a fellow Web3 DGen, you know, I've been looking at other things as well. Um, I know you have your eyes out there and you have your finger on the pulse. So I want to ask you this and maybe you, can, <laughs> you know, what, what, what project do you have your eyes on that's outside of Everseed? First of all, I just want to give a shout out to Jason and Iko and, and the Folios team in general. Um, uh, they were, I have no idea how the F they, they have like some of the greatest alpha I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're like super early in joining our community and they've been following our journey for a while. And um, uh, yeah, and, and, and we're actually very close. Like I, I consider Jason and Iko to be, uh, you know, really great um, uh, uh, kind of thought partners with us um, now and, and going forward into the future. And so, um, yeah, shout out, to, shout out to them. They're very underrated. They're, they're an amazing, they're I think some of the best first principles thinkers in Web3 for sure, especially on the um, consumer application side. Um, and in terms of, okay, what, uh, what alpha, <laughs> what games get me excited? Or, or is it about games or basically any kind of like application in general? Any Web3 application that, you know, if someone was thinking out there, you want, you know, okay, this is not financial advice, but, you know, what can I look into? What's, what's something you have on your ear? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, application. So, uh, man. So many people have asked me this question, and I just there's like not much that really excites me, to be honest. And um, that's that's fair too, right? I mean, it could be the the way things are at the moment. Yeah, I um, I'll tell you what I think I um I'm keeping kind of like tabs on. So I I think I think the two best founders in the space um, that I respect uh but i think they're also they have like very distinct strengths and weaknesses like in a lot of ways i feel like the strengths and weaknesses of one founder are actually mirrored like exact opposites of the strengths and weaknesses of the other founder but i very much respect um marco taro from azra and gabe Layden from uh from limit break who is the x machine zone guy they're very different personalities i think they both really understand web3 and I think they have very different strategies and tactics with respect to how to go to market. Um, and and yeah, I, I think that they both, again, they're very, very different individuals, but I think they both are very smart. Um, uh, do I agree with their approach? Uh, you know, in some ways, yes, but in some ways, no. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, I... Um, yeah, I, I, I am I am very interested in the general on-chain gaming space. And I think that there is, but I think it's still really, really quite early. But I'm kind of like, that's the space that I'm looking at, uh, uh, you know, eagerly from kind of like a, uh, from almost more, more like a DJ rather than a builder pr perspective. Like, I'm just like, 
very interested to see how the space evolves. And I don't think we're going to see a fully on-chain game that actually reach, like, reaches critical mass for many years, like maybe like five years or so. But that's but I'm I follow a lot of the different kind of like um, uh, projects there. Um, I think Elixir is interesting in terms of you know what they're doing from like a marketplace or business model perspective of providing liquidity for NFTs. Um, I have some concerns about the legality of what they're doing because they're doing fractionalization of NFTs, which is legal in the U.S. and many other jurisdictions. But you know, uh, you know, I think that uh, they definitely. Are, uh, are, are being are, are, are thought provoking at the least. Um, yeah, and I, I, uh, I, I think I think that's that's kind of the things that I'm thinking about or looking at right now. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Um, definitely heard some stuff that I don't know about, so I'll be uh, checking that out if with the little time that I have. But you know, if if Kenny's looking into it, I'm gonna be looking into it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, any other questions or things you wanted to chat about? Yeah, I know you're super busy. So real quick, I, I have a, a, a lightning round set up. Uh, quick questions. You give me your, your quick answer. And uh, just to close it out, we'll go right now. First question, what's been your best memory or experience so far in Web3? Um, yeah, be quick, Kenny. <laughs> Okay. okay, fine. Lightning round. Uh, uh, basically, aping into Azuki on reveal date and being a part of that journey because that was the best lesson that I ever learned to, you know, uh, about kind of the experience of of writing a project through its ups and downs. Um, and uh, and that was a lesson for me. So I just paused because I don't want people to think that I'm always shilling Azuki, but it's just it's just a very transformative experience for me, kind of personally, to kind of like experience that. So right. Okay. Uh, your favorite battle plan? Okay. Um, wow. Uh, uh, Blastwort. I, 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 I'm sorry I'm a Blastwort Maxi, but I just love the AOE splash. It just feels so good. I love the thunk. You know, the, the sound feels so good to hear. Yeah, yeah. My, I'm, 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 a, I'm a favorite Creeper kind of guy. I got okay. dark, dark Creeper. Um, the Mega Splime level, hard or easy? That would be. It took me three tries to beat that, so I beat, I beat that on the third try internally. Uh, so I enjoy. I'm a masochist, so I enjoy the difficulty, but I don't know how others feel about it. So, <laughs> all right, last question: Corgi or honey bear? Uh, honey bear. H honey bear. Don't give a shit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like the honey yeah, bear as I, well. Cool, cool. And, all right. uh, and we'll have, and we'll have more. We'll have more pets coming down the line. More companions too. So stay, nice. stay tuned, friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's a, a lot of uh, art so far about the new companion. So looking forward to seeing what's coming out. All right. That awesome. wraps up the, the questions. Uh, again, you know, thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, appreciate hearing from you. Um, not for your, not only for your time, but really, you know, the thoughtful answers that you provided. Um, it really, I think, speaks to to sort of how, how how vested and how committed you are and the team to to what you guys are building and i think that's really uh, encouraging to hear that um any last words uh no no that's it yeah thanks so much for taking the time and yeah uh, thanks for also for you know you and everyone else who's been a loyal kind of community member and uh stay tuned for more fun and more surprises uh and so yeah things are cooking sounds good sounds good all right thank you very much kenny i'll see you around